Good morning. Just checking that we're all good there. This morning we have lecture one uh, from AGNR 175, which is Introduction to California Agriculture. And that is going to be from the first part, the preface in your book, and then as this first slide tells you, page 3 through 22. And this will also be what you have on quiz 1A, which is, going, which is up already for this week. So here we go. Uh, Field Guide to California Agriculture, that's the book, Stars and Goin. A uh, little bit flowery written, but just enjoy it. And they're kind of trying to tell a story. Um, but different from some of the texts you've probably had before, but uh, should be fun. Um, talks about things like, does California have its own economy and geography? And then what's the role of agriculture in that? Um, California has the seventh largest economy, last time I checked, worldwide. So we definitely have our, our own economy, and agriculture is a huge part of it. It's I think about third in total revenue when you look at service industry and things like that. But in terms of scope and history and how it's a part of Ag California, it's uh, much bigger than that. It was also in terms of how much land it uses, it's much bigger than that. Uh, geography, uh, the people, the, to the topography, the tremendous difference in climates and altitudes and rain shadows and things like that. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, labor, talked about climate, technology. We seem to always be ahead of technology in California. We're going to see out in, uh, out in the Mojave Desert, out in Hinkley, we're going to see one of the most progressive irrigation systems. Um, it, that it's, a, it's a center pivot system that is the most sophisticated out there right now. So we're always leading in technology. We're going to see some tractors and stuff that run on their own. They're self-driven, self-guided with GPS. So um, you should be able to get a good look just locally here at that technology and this amazing California agriculture. It's grown in all kinds of places. There's little, little operations. There's a lot of operations up here that we don't know about. For example, we've got some uh, jujubes. Uh, that's, a, that's an industry that's growing very fast up here with Korean American farmers. Um, and there's always novel crops and clever cultivars that we're developing. A few years ago, that picture there is of uh, sturgeon, which is a huge fish, a native fish, and then caviar. And this fellow was growing those in little plastic ponds and producing his own caviar um, in California, in the Central Valley. So that, if you didn't know that was there, that's a little nook and a cranny and a novel thing going on that you just wouldn't expect at all. But very innovative, I think, is the point. Um, some are tiny, some are agro-industrial. So we're going to talk also about industrial-scale farming, the way it's done uh, in, with big corporate farms and, and big industry. And it's an industry, not a small little home farmer anymore. And we're going to talk about where the place is for that and, and where we think we could go, you guys can start developing an opinion on where that industrial scale agriculture fits in the future. And then, of course, things like organic and ecosystem friendly farming. We're going to look at some of those sustainable practices, uh, some of the sustainable ag practices that really work with the natural cycles. Uh, many distinct products, uh, 400 at least. Um, specialty things, those are kumquats. I don't know if you've ever had those. I think they're kind of weird, but um, some people like them. There's animal-derived foodstuffs that we produce. There's, there's things that we produce that aren't considered staples. In fact, kind of be talking about we're not really in the staple agriculture business. We produce vegetables, which are staples, but staples are things like corn, rice, wheat that are produced mostly in this country in the Midwest. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, those are the staples in some, some group's diet. We're, we're a group of people that are mostly wheat-based. South America, Central America, we are looking at, at corn as the staple. Okay? Um, California is the most dramatic modern agricultural landscape in the world. And if you've traveled at all, you'll know that that's so true. I'm one of those weird people that can drive up I-5 
up through the San Joaquin Valley, the bread basket of the world it's sometimes called. And I just love to look at the stuff. And my wife will get really upset because I'll stop and try to identify what product that is, what crop that is. Look at all the aqueducts, all the water aqueducts that are crisscrossing that thing. Look at the weird technology that's going on. I remember one day I was driving along and I saw a cloud of dust and then I stopped and here comes these little sort of rodent-like machines coming down the rows of almonds and they stop at each tree and they actually shake them. They have little arms that come across that little short little thing that buzzes around. They shake the tree and then they literally come behind that and vacuum the almond nuts off the ground. So it's just a fascinating place. Uh, other people drive on that road and, oh my gosh, that's such a boring road. And am I ever going to get to San Francisco? Uh, that's kind of more their thinking. Um, there's a drama going on. It's physical. It's human. It's cultural, e economic. Uh, if you, any of you have been around farming, you know that it's very dramatic. Continually faced by new challenges, right? Those poor folks in uh, Houston right now were talking about the cities. But what about the farmers? This is a time when they were going to be getting ready to harvest crops, for example, end of summer. So those all would have been wiped out as well. Uh, Wendell Barry um, warned of losing sight of our base, our, our, the fact that we are part of the land, we grow up with the land, we kind of forget. And one of the ways we forget is we don't even really appreciate where our food comes from. We go to the supermarket, we buy it, we look for the cheapest, and we eat it, and we don't really even consider where it comes from, from, how hard it was to get it to the market, and also um, appreciate kind of the ins and outs of how special that food is. We can, for example, buy strawberries or, uh, or blackberries all year round because it's imported from other parts of the world. That's, you know, middle of the winter is not the growing season for strawberries. Um, so, little quote here, I begin with the proposition that eating is an agricultural act. Eating ends in the annual drama of food economy that begins with planting and birth. So there's this drama that goes on to produce the food. We're just used to it just showing up. It's almost, I think some people, we kind of laugh about it, but I think some people kind of think that it's somehow, the milk really is somehow produced in the back of Stater Brothers. And the eggs are some kind of produce. We know a chicken's involved somehow, but we don't really understand what that means. And if we don't understand what that means, then as a society, we're going to make some decisions for our future, our sustainability, that don't make sense. Okay? Um, California is home to 37 million people, a little bit more than that now. And we're not well connected with our environment. Here locally in the high desert, we're fortunate because we are. We, uh, we, we have dogs and animals. Many of you, some of you hopefully had done an FFA or a 4-H project while you're in school, while you're in, in, uh, in K-12 school. Um, all those kinds of things. You've taken some hikes. You uh, have maybe grown some food in your own backyard. You have your own composting bin. You're connected. You kind of feel it. But when you grow up in the big city of LA, you just have no idea. And, it's, and that's why I'm so passionate about teaching about this kind of stuff, because we are running out of resources, and food's critical. Food's obviously one of the big three resources that we need just to live. And if we don't understand that we're abusing our soils that produce this, we're abusing our water supplies that, that water this food, then we're in trouble. We're not sustainable. And they, then you can start thinking of some doom and gloom scenarios. There is a nice picture of this amazing produce. I'm always amazed as a, as a we, we grew up on a small farm in South Africa of just the absolute um, diversity and how beautiful it all looks in a supermarket. That's not unusual to see a picture like that. But actually in real world, you know, there's maybe a little insect bite or two on this. And that apple and that apple are very different in size. But in our modern world, those all get thrown away or disposed of, and we just get to see the perfect. And, and it's, that's even not very realistic, right? There's this new movement called ugly food, where you eat that stuff and, and make use of it. And maybe that smaller apple is actually the, the really juicy, sweetest one. 
Uh, Panoramic Glimpse, page 3 through 14, basically a book looking at, at agriculture in general. It's a field guide, so it's kind of like a field guide for birds of California. We're looking at agriculture. What's going on in, 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 uh, in California agriculture? 50% of California is privately owned. Um, only 20% of the Mojave, 80% of the land, which is really interesting for managing in our local area in these deserts, only 20% is owned privately. The rest is government owned. Could be Bureau of Land Management, could be Forest Service, could be National Park Service, could be uh, military. But those, that's very different. So when we're going to do agriculture, we're only looking at 20% of the land in the first place. Um, and it presents some interesting kinds of variables for us living out here in terms of how we're going to manage. For example, we're going to look at managing cattle grazing out on federal lands and how that's changed over time and become more restricted. Um, and is that really a good way to go, given that if we don't graze that land, it becomes more susceptible to fire. There's more stuff out there to burn. Okay? Uh, the size and diversity of California agri is, is massive. Um, there's just canal canals and aqueducts and worker housing and haul yards, and it's just big industrial scale stuff going on. There's massive dairies. We're going to visit a dairy that visit, uh, milks about 1,200 cows. Okay? Airplanes and helicopters. Last time in San Joaquin Valley, I was watching a helicopter flying over doing some crop spraying. Okay? Um, and all kinds of stuff going. So agriculture really defines the landscape of California. Um, otherwise, it's the cities, I guess, if you like driving through cities and looking at cities. And it's big business in scale, in province, province, in profits, and in prominence. California agriculture, we'll learn in a moment, is very prominent across the United States and across the world. It, for example, leads the, the world in production of almonds. Okay? Uh, it's the most consistent economy, in part because it is physically grounded in, in the history of California. It's part of who we are. If we decide to kind of phase out agriculture because we don't think raising cattle is appropriate, like some people now believe, um, because of methane and basically cattle flatulence, um, we need to look at that in a bigger scale. Is that part of our culture? For example, many of us still like to wear cowboy belts and, and we're part of the land, and that's kind of our Western culture, and we like to eat beef. So we need to look, is, is that really realistic that we're going to throw that out based on maybe some misinformation and not seeing the big picture? Okay. Um, so at various points in history, mining commerce offered com competition to agriculture. Today, computer electronic uh, uh, manufacturer, construction, tourism, service economy, which is McDonald's and food and, and uh, tourism all, uh, all uh, offer a big challenge economically or, or maybe surpass California in uh, agriculture in California, but it's still extremely important. It's still huge. 37 billion wholesale activity. Uh, auxiliary support service, if you look at the feed stores and, uh, and the pharmaceutical companies and the seed production companies, and all of those, it is a hundred billion. And, and the whole uh, economic value chain, as you look down through all the manufacturing and support, is 300 billion. 75,000 farms, so that's quite a lot. Fortunately, we don't just have these massive corporate industrial farms. We st still have a lot of uh, smaller farmers, and we're going to look at why and how it's important to help those local farmers stay in business and stay competitive. Um, and 2.5 million people involved, uh, employed, possibly the biggest employer, with an average pay in a recent report of over 50,000. So we kind of have this picture of these are people picking strawberries, working in the dirt, which sometimes they are. But actually, it's, it takes a lot of high-tech, very well-trained people to run this. So $50,000 average pay is not so bad. 
okay? Um, agricultural and ed education, natural resource education like we do here, prepares people for what we call these green careers, right? It could be in production, it could be in water conservation, and things like soil science and plant science that you could take with us. Uh, we are developing a new pathway where you could start in high school. That's why these classes are going, some of these classes are going out to high school. And you can go through the community college and transfer with as low as a 2.0 grade point average to a Cal State and, and continue to a four-year degree. Because many of these jobs, especially with the government agency, require a four-year degree. We have the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You'll be seeing some of their people guest lecturing in this class. Um, and they uh, are right in Victorville. I serve on one of the, the volunteer organizations, the Resource Conservation District. In fact, I'm going there today to the monthly meeting. And they employ, I'm going to say, about 20 people in that office. And they're all very highly paid. And they're looking for people. But in general, we've got four of our graduates working there, and they don't have four-year degrees. But in general, the really well-paid, long-term positions require a four-year degree. So we're working on preparing people for the technical side of things. Um, one of our people works in irrigation over there, irrigation uh, basically consulting on irrigation supplies and stuff for farmers and landscapes. All right, agriculture in California, season to season, is never entirely the same. Things are always changing. Climate's changing. Demand's changing. We're always trying to innovate. Uh, the climate's changes, changing markets. We mo might overplant. What farmers tend to do is they see a crop that um, has a lot of upside potential, like kiwi fruit a few years ago, and then too many people get into it and overplant it. And so they have to figure out where that balance is on their own. Pest problems, we've always got new pests coming in. And then the flow of fashionable crops. Like today, almonds are huge, uh, almonds as they call them, and pistachios are rising very quickly. And we have a nice little pistachio growing uh, group here in, uh, in the Mojave. In fact, that's growing quite quickly, the pistachios. And then, of course, grapes. We're always wondering about grapes and wine when we're going to reach the, the saturation point of that market. Wine production all over the world has been growing very quickly for quite a few, few uses. Almonds are pretty big water users. They're less than some other things, but they're pretty big. And they've got issues like pest problems or pollination problems, colony collapse disorder, where they, they pollinator, the honeybee, is going through this thing called colony collapse disorder where whole colonies will just die off. And we're trying to figure out exactly what's causing that. And uh, that'll be a really good, uh, as you look at your doing your uh, sustainable practice report for agriculture, your 100 points for this class, that's a really cool one to look at. What is colony collapse disorder and what effect does it have on crops that require pollination? And how does that all that work? Okay, there's some almonds. Um, I personally love almonds, so uh, it's a huge crop. Like I said, 98% of the world's supply comes from California. Um, so other states specialize in a handful of crops. Kansas, you know, soybeans, maize, wheat, and that's about it. Uh, we grow everything and anything. And then the other thing we need to think about is where we're placed. We're right on the Pacific Rim here, and we have a huge export market. We have uh, big, some of the biggest harbors, ports in the world, uh, the biggest one being right down here at San Pedro, Long Beach, and we can easily export um, to, to the rest of the world. And so we've got an $11 billion export industry in 208. Uh, locally, interesting export things going on. Just in the last year, I haven't visited them yet, but if you go up here on I Avenue from the college, um, actually, his yeah, I Avenue to E Avenue, there's a place where they're taking huge bales of alfalfa, the big square bales, and they're compressing them down and putting them in shipping containers and shipping them, I'm presuming a lot to China, where China, because of its affluence now, wants to 
have as a market for things that are, are more for affluent people, which is milk and meat and those kinds of things. So China, for example, is very aggressively pursuing its own dairy uh, industry. Um, and, and they're importing hay, especially alfalfa, which is very rich in nutrients, as we'll find out again when we go out to the, to the dairies. Okay? It's cool to be a farmer again, which is kind of cool. It used to be, oh, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm going to be a farmer. People would look at you like, ooh, that guy doesn't have, that guy or girl doesn't have much going on for them. It's not that way anymore. Uh, lots of people involved in community-supported agriculture will get to talk about what that is. And farmers markets, we have one right here at the college on Thursdays. And then we've got some massive movement in what we call the foodies, people that take their food very seriously. My oldest son is one of these. He loves food and he's into the new paleo diet and cooks very well and very interested in the quality of that food. Is it organic? Is it the meat? Is it range raised or grass fed? Things like that. Um, so within the 100 million acres of California, there are more concentrated, more diverse ag agricultural products than any other site in the world, okay? And that makes it kind of fun for us to study, okay? So you're driving around, again, the book kind of goes over and over some of this stuff, but just in one little area, you can see all kinds of variables. Uh, products, we talked a little bit about wines, California wines. I just had a, a field trip uh, last year up into uh, the Napa area and looking at that amazing industry up there. And it's now top of the line. It's world renowned. It's as good as anything in France, okay? And there's a lot of money in it. That's the, the, the production in billions. Um, there's a huge, but again, how many people are drinking wine and when does that market kind of peak out? There's a lot of concern about that. I guess we could all continue to drink too much wine and become winos or something. Okay, um, there's the da-da, we already said that. Oh yeah, now talking about some of the areas, we're talking about how big this is. This is some of the diversity again. But Fresno is the, the, is the highest dollar producing agricultural county, Fresno County. Fresno, the city is in the middle of that. Um, great place for our students to transfer, by the way. Uh, rivaled only by another California county, Tulare, which is just south of that, I believe, and immediate, oh, immediately to its south. So those are the two top producing counties in the United States year after year in terms of agriculture. Uh, so more important, let's, we'll start looking at some of the issues. Um, right at the top of the, li the, the list, which really resonates me, with me, is lack of education and appreciation of agricultural importance. Uh, most Californians are ignorant of agriculture's impact uh, on the land and its importance, which we've just talked about. Uh, the next one is this industrial ag industrialized agriculture. We'll go into that. Um, we, I'm going to have you read chapter seven from our regular normal kind of staple book, which is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sustaining the earth which we use for many other classes. Uh, chapter seven will be loaded on your blackboard, but um, that'll look at what industrial agriculture looks like, right? When we use a lot of pesticides, when we use a lot of artificial fertilizers, when we use really high-tech technology, uh, tractors and that kind of stuff, um, what's the place and, what's, and there's a lot of confusion about that. A lot of people thinking that this is always bad um, and that's just not true. Uh, water shortages, we all know we've just come through very, very severe, probably the most severe five-year drought in California, and we've just barely come out of it. Northern part of the state did really well last year. Locally, we just had a little bit below average, actually. So our local aquifer is still struggling. We, we depend on our local aquifer, our groundwater for all our supplies. And we'll be talking about how we manage that. It's actually a very exciting story. We actually do a really good job of managing our local water. Uh, urbanization is another big one. As cities spread out, and 
This happens in two ways. The city is spread out in the actual footprint, but it's also another thing that I want to make you aware of. It's called urbanization, or excuse me, urban sprawl. And I'm guilty of that. That's where we all say, okay, I'd like to have my two and a half acres, my seven and a half acres. And what I've just recently done is gone way out in the desert. It's not that far out, but it's remote. And bought seven and a half acres, and we've built our off-the-grid, green design home. It's a learning center for, for green stuff. But we break up that, that uh, land, and basically we make little islands. And so certain animals need undisturbed area. and They don't need a fence plot here and a fence plot there that breaks it up. Uh, things like roadrunners definitely are affected by that. We still see roadrunners out there, fortunately, but that's called urban sprawl. It's not just the cities themselves, but it's people that are urban living in urban-sized properties that sprawl out over the landscape. That has an effect as well. 28% um, of the land, and this is pretty incredible, 28% of the land in California, developed in California from 204, 1990 to 204, about 15 years, was high quality farmland, okay? Farmland is special place stuff. It's, it's flat normally, it's got good soils, um, it's normally in the floodplain of rivers, and that's where people want to live. People want to li live, live next to the water. They tend to settle in those very same places. So there's this competition between unfair competition for very high priced urban city land and then farmland. And that's something we need to balance because we've, we're, we are, uh, we've used about as much land as we can use um, and we need to take care of what we have. Okay? Um, richest and deepest soils are being settled and have been settled since early times. Next one is environmental uh, conservation is really becoming, people are becoming much more aware and there are a lot more laws and regulations about environmental conservation. Conservation means management. How do we manage our environment better? So that's restoring land. We have, a, we have uh, some classes here in, the, in, our, in our department to do with ecological restoration, which is restoring uh, disturbed land and leaving enough water to conserve the environment. So for example, water is a big issue. So not only do we need water for ag, we not only do we need water for urban, for people, we also need water, enough water to take care of certain species of fish. And there's certain high profile ones. For example, salmon fisheries. There's a thing going on in the Columbia River Gorge right now, other than the big fire there right now, where they're making sure there's enough fresh water flowing down the river and not being used by agriculture upstream to make sure that we've this, the, the fish can still run, they can do, still do their spawning. What is, why is that raised there, regions, climbs, and products? This is the, sub, the subheading for this section, page 17 through 22. Uh, and basically start looking at these distinct agricultural regions. We're going to look at these later in the class. Um, I'm going to ask you to read them and, and know a little bit about these distinct regions. But because the climate and the topography and the mountain ranges and everything are so different across the state, we, we've they, the book and we've divided up to 11 distinct agricultural regions, right, which grow very different kinds of crops. Okay? Um, and we need to start looking at, at the climate. As we drive from north to south, California dries out, right? There's a place up there um, in Northern California that has like 90 inches of rainfall, okay? Down in the very south in Blythe, you've got two or three inches of rainfall. Right here, we've got about average of eight inches of rainfall, okay? So as you move south, there's a big difference in, in rainfall. And of course, crops don't grow without, without, without water, so that's very significant, okay? Um, so the wettest, again, are up there in Oregon, Humboldt County, that's another great university that we, we uh, like to send students to, which is Humboldt, Cal State Humboldt. Uh, there's a quick look at some of those regions. We'll be coming back to this, but for example, the desert region, which includes us, Mojave, 
and the Sonoran Desert, which is Palm Desert, uh, Palm Springs, Coachella Valley, Imperial County, down that way. Uh, winter vegetables, dates, grapes, grapefruit, uh, and then hay crops, which is still today our biggest one locally as well. Um, things like alfalfa, we can grow a lot of alfalfa very efficiently, but it's growing in a very dry area and we have to get water to it. So we actually artificially distribute the water to that, those areas through aqueducts. Or we pump it out of the groundwater basin, like we do in uh, Newbury Springs. We're still producing a lot of alfalfa out there, and we, we pump that out of the groundwater. We sink boreholes and pump it up. Well, we've got to make sure that we conserve that supply. So we're going to make sure we don't overdraft, overpump those, those uh, groundwater basins. And we'll be looking that, at that under, under our water management section of this class. Uh, we're classified as a Mediterranean. Got to know this, guys. This is going to come up on several tests, for one thing. A uh, Mediterranean climate is like the Mediterranean, right? Over in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Greece, countries like that, Egypt, they have dry summers and wet winters, okay? Well, just think about that. When do plants grow? Well, they actually grow in the summer when it's hotter, more day length. But that's when we're dry. So that's why most of our crops in California are grown with artificial irrigation. We, we take water to them and use drip irrigation or sprinklers to get the water to them. Naturally, we don't get that rain at the right time. That kind of farming is called dry land farming. And that's what most of the rest of the world does. And that's the real concern with climate change. If people can't predict that, for example, in India, they're going to get those monsoons that allow their rice to grow at a certain time of the year, then we're in a lot of trouble. Those people, that will completely turn around the food production uh, systems for all parts of the world, right? Um, similar countries that border the Mediterranean Sea, da -da, we talked about that, Western Australia, and then parts of South Africa where I'm from. The southern, very southern, southern part of Africa, uh, where, I, where I'm from, southern, uh, the Cape province, right down at the bottom. I'm actually from a little bit north. I'm from KwaZulu-Natal province. Um, and we have a regular summer rainfall. We, we, we don't have a Mediterranean rainfall. Climate, again, looking at some of those things, has to do with latitude, up or down from the equator, nearest, nearness to the coast. Uh, our, most of our moisture comes from the coast and has to do with elevation. We, if you've done basic something on the water cycle, understand how rainfall works, works but we're going to do a little bit of that in this class. Um, coastal California, we have to understand, um, is pretty dry um, relatively. Even right on the coast, down there in uh, San Diego, down there in Orange County, there's still only 12, 14 inches of rain a year, average, and that's because it's a very cold current. It's not a warm current that goes along our shores. And that then allows for less evaporation, and then when winds blow, that evaporation, that moisture on land, there's just less moisture to make rainfall. Um, and that's why our coast is relatively, uh, relatively dry. Where I'm from, South Africa, we're about the same distance from the ocean, but it's a warm ocean. And our rainfall is about 40 inches. Here it's 8, there it's 40 inches, and that's because we have a warm ocean current. Okay? Um, temperatures, you need to know that temperatures rise up to 1 degree for every 1 mile that you move inland. Because what, again, does that beautiful water do? It moderates that the temperature. Understand water chemistry, it basically holds that temperature so that and, and, and cools and then and, and then heats at certain times of the year. That's why on right on the coast in California and San Diego, it just varies a few degrees average from winter to summer. Okay? Unlike what we've been doing in the last few weeks, this huge variation. Extreme local variation as we go along. If you look at Salinas Valley, which is up near, uh, 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 just below San Francisco, summer fog helps artichokes and berries. 
But further inland, in the Salinas Valley, there's less, it's, it keeps it cool enough where they can grow lettuce, spinach, kale, and broccoli. Um, and then we're just pointing out that Victor Valley, not only do we have a low rainfall, it's also very spotty. It's very, uh, it, it comes in spurts, right? It, it, we either get a lot of rain or none at all, and we really can't predict it. We actually had a little bit of rainfall early this morning in August, which is kind of strange, okay? Uh, mountain areas, the Sierras are wetter, for, uh, Sierras for, are wetter than the valleys. And in a good year, hold a bank of snow, okay? So this is our big story in, in California water. We have a snow bank in the Sierras because the Sierras just happen to be in the right place. And that holds our bank of water. Our 50% of California's water supply is in that snow bank. And it's held so that in the springtime, it starts melting, runs down. It's picked up by all these dams that we'll be talking about later, put into aqueducts. It's this, this artificial plumbing system. And then it's distributed all over the state for agriculture, for the environment, and for urban. Okay? Um, but when you talk about up in the mountains itself, there's no arable land up there. There's no flat land to grow. It's too cold. So we don't actually grow food up there in the mountains, but it stores the water so that we can grow it down in the valleys. Okay, so quickly, rain shadow, very significant in California because of all the mountains. Uh, so what you're looking at here is, is basically, I talked about the ocean, evaporation, Moist, warm air blows onshore. As it rises, it cools, and that moisture condenses. And at some point, condenses in the clouds enough to form rain or snow. As it goes over the top of the mountain, let's think about the San, San Bernardino Mountains right here. So on the other side, Rancho Cucamonga side, we're getting all this happening. Mount Baldy getting some rain. As it goes over the the top, now the air starts to warm and it actually basically starts to suck air back out of the environment. Out, and so it, it, it def, it's less likely to rain, okay? Descends, warms, and promotes evaporation, not uh, precipitation, okay? As you go down the other side. And that's called a rain shadow. And we're in a rain shadow from the San Bernardino Mountains. That's why our rainfall here is significantly less than Rancho Cucamonga, for example. And then if you go further away from us, if you go out into uh, the Mojave here, we've got several ranges of mountains that do the same thing, okay? So rain shadow, know what that is, okay? Here's a quick look at some of the mountain ranges that we have. We always have these coastal ranges, and then further south here we have these transverse ranges like the San Bernardino Mountains that go sideways across the, the state. And each one of those has a rain shadow. So depending on where you're trying to grow crops, depend, very significant where you are, which side of those mountains and how many ranges of mountains it has to have gone over before it gets to. If you're way down here in the south, uh, not only is it, is, it, is it less rainfall north to south, but there's a significant number of ranges before you reach out here to Blythe, which is one of the, one of the driest areas. So a significant number of rain shadows. Less rainfall each time it goes over a set of mountains. Okay, water. Many consider dairy, desert areas the least productive. You speak to the average person, they're like, oh, that's just desert out there. You've got this, this in your mind, this dry, sandy, nothing grows kind of Im image. But really, those soils, we will look at soil and what it is, just a bunch of little, little rocks, really, little, little particles of, of rock. If you give it water and you add some, some compost, some kind of organic material, our soils are as good as anything. And people, you'll notice that very well. Once you build up your soil in your backyard, it'll grow anything. Hardest part is the temperature variations we have, not the soil. Um, so California is very dry. It has this complicated water system. It's called a, we're called a hydraulic society because we're always pulling and pushing water all over the place, okay? It's an intricate system of dams to catch that water, mostly off the Sierras, but in other places, and then aqueducts to transport it all over the state. 
aqueducts, canals, ditches. Okay. Uh, other threats are, and we're going to look at that, by the way, other threats are drought years. We just talked about that. Um, and places we call these food basket of the world, the San Joaquin Valley. Now, that's that valley. If we look here, let's go back here real quick. This is the San Joaquin Valley. This brown area right here, right? It's a huge area, part of San of California, and Bakersfield in the south, um, uh, trying to think of this town right here, Sacramento is about here, way up here to, eh, up here, another town, way north here. But this is our amazingly rich agricultural area. Anything will grow if you give it water, and it's, this is where all the diversity happens. Definitely the richest agricultural area in the world. That's the San Joaquin Valley. Okay. Um, drought. We'll come back to all those aqueducts, by the way, later. Just l know a little bit about that. Um, so drought. San Joaquin Valley is in all intents and purposes a desert. Near Bakersfield, what's the rainfall? About the same as us. And if you look around there, you can see about eight inches. Okay. Uh, but um, all the way in the north, they actually even grow rice up near Sacramento. We grow a large amount of rice, and that requires flooding. Um, you actually have to flood the rice for a little bit for, to make it grow. So these are big decisions on how, what kind of crops we grow are appropriate. Is it appropriate to flood our land and lose all that water from evaporation, um, or should we grow something else? Other issues are energy. Agriculture uses a lot of energy. Where is it coming? Is it all still fossil fuel? Um, and then that relation to, to global warming and, and climate change. Terrorism, our water supply, for example, is very uh, prone to terrorism. If you had to blow up our California aqueduct that comes right through, through Hesperia here, going to, uh, to Lake Silverwood and then down to LA, supplying a lot of the water for the LA basin. Um, would cause a huge effect in a few days, okay, if you had to uh, blow that up or poison it or something. Earthquakes can totally disrupt our water system, our transport system, and have a huge effect, okay? And those would be effect on us as communities, but also affect on our food supply. Okay, so there we are growing uh, wheat. There is a bunch of water flowing out, and we're like, Somehow, magically, this water appears, but you can see there's all kinds of infrastructure that brings that water in. And that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck on Quiz 1A.